Welcome to this bonus episode of the Maine Science Podcast. I'm Kate Dickerson. This episode is an audio recording of the February 2021 online MSF forum, Offshore Wind from the UK to Maine. I teamed up with Ronit Prar from the UK Science and Innovation Network to run this session, which made it our first international collaboration. We heard from Tony Appleton from Burns and McDonnell for the UK perspective, Habib Dagger from the University of Maine, covering Maine, and Dan Burgess of the Maine Energy Office talking about some of the policy connections between the two. Thanks to our online forum sponsor, the Bioscience Association of Maine, and media sponsor, Maine Public, for supporting the Maine Science Festival and these forums. One note, while we've edited for audio, if you'd like to get the full experience of the forum, you can find the video recording on the Maine Science Festival YouTube channel. I've included a link in the show notes. Uh, my name is Kate Dickerson. I am the founder and director of the Maine Science Festival. Uh, today we have, uh, I'm delighted that we have uh, a session that we were going to run at the festival last year that we weren't able to uh, run due to the pandemic. This is offshore wind from the UK to Maine. And uh, before we jump right into it, I'm going to do a quick round of introductions so that uh, you know who's speaking. We will have uh, Tony Appleton, who is with, uh, he's the director of offshore wind for Burns and McDonald, who's in the, uh, from the UK. He specializes in offshore renewables and interconnection of global markets. Habib Dagger, who's the founding executive director of the University of Maine's Advanced Structures and Composite Center. Uh, he's a longtime friend and presenter of the festival, and I am uh, delighted to say, coming in March, he will be one of our featured uh, trading card folks. I'll have more on that later. Um, Dan Burgess is the director of Maine's, uh, the Maine Governor's Energy Office. He was uh, appointed in 2019 prior to uh, getting back, I assume, blissfully back to Maine. He, uh, he worked in Massachusetts at the Department of Energy Resources and the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. And I'm going to hand it off to Renee to let her introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's so lovely to be here. Um, huge thanks to Kate and to the Maine Science Festival for um, collaborating with us on this session, which we're super excited about. Um, my name is Ronit. I'm the director of the UK government's Science and Innovation Network. We are affectionately known as the SINNERS, Science and Innovation Network being the best three-letter acronym in government. Um, our mission is to broaden and deepen the science and innovation collaborations and connections between the UK and our host countries. I direct the UK's uh, science and innovation team for the Eastern US, which means I have the great privilege of working with the great state of Maine, um, one of our favourite places. And uh, since my arrival in 2016, we've done lots of work with um, main colleagues and one of the uh, areas that we have focused on especially has been offshore wind. Um, the UK and Maine are natural partners in this sector. Together we are really more than the sum of our parts which is the inspiration for this session um, and we are so grateful to have a panelist both from the UK and from the US to talk to us about um, the different sort of structures of the way that offshore wind works in our respective homes across the pond. Before we hear from them though, um, I am really excited that we have Dan Burgess online from the governor's office. And Dan is going to say a few words of welcome and also uh, tell us a little bit about a very exciting initiative that we have been um, thick as thieves working on for some time, which got announced last month. So I will not steal your thunder, Dan, and I'll hand over to you. And just before I do that, I will say, um, folks, that after after Dan gives us a few words on our recent project, we'll hand over to Tony and Habib to give you 10 minutes each, but we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So please do throw questions in the chat as we move along. Um, and then I'll hand that to our panelists as we go through the session. So looking forward to a great hour with you all. And I'll hand over to Dan. Yeah, great. Thanks so much. It's great to be with everyone this uh, uh, snowy, icy afternoon, uh, or more, uh, I guess, afternoon now here in Maine. Um, if you're like me, you've got kids running around in the background, so um, I may be, may be uh, joined by a guest at some point. But 
Um, really pleased to, to, to be here with you all. I think I'm excited to hear uh, from uh, both uh, Habib and Tony about the opportunities and what's happening um, in this space. But um, as was mentioned, um, well, you know, Maine has really, over the last two years, made some um, great strides on uh, combating climate change and increasing clean energy from um, having greenhouse gas emission reduction uh, requirements in statute to having uh, one of the most ambitious clean energy requirements in the country at 80% by 2030 um, to the governor's uh, recently accepting the, or uh, receiving the climate action plan, the state's first four-year climate action plan. And, and that was updated first um, updated in a while. Um, and with that announcing the opportunity to, or the goal of uh, doubling the number of clean energy jobs in, in Maine, really see an opportunity to both advance um, clean energy, but also to, to grow Maine's economy. Um, so hand in hand with that, uh, the uh, state of Maine uh, signed a memorandum of understanding with the United Kingdom to advance partnerships on uh, clean energy and combating climate change. So this is a bi bilateral partnership um, uh, to promote and foster sustainable growth, support innovation, and strengthen uh, the overall global response to climate change. Um, this is uh, came out of an uh, early 2020 visit uh, the governor took to Scotland, pr just prior to the to the pandemic. Had the opportunity to go to Edinburgh and Aberdeen, and really um, on a floating offshore wind mission, uh, see what uh, all the exciting things that are happening in the, in the United Kingdom, and particularly in Scotland, on on floating offshore wind. And so, this this agreement we're looking forward to to executing and to working in uh, partnership on with our. Uh, uh, folks on this call and, and others to look how we can collaborate, share resources, um, and everything from the heating and transportation sectors, but also with a particular focus on 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 offshore wind and floating offshore wind. And so we're going to be, um, you know, cooperating on evaluating impacts, looking at technology, workforce development, port infrastructure, all the things that really can see the sector sector grow. Um, and so we're excited to be, I'm excited to be participating uh, today and to continuing to strengthen this relationship as we tackle these important issues together. So I'll leave my remarks at that because I'm excited to hear from the speakers, um, but really pleased to be here with you all today. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, it's great to have you here. And for folks who are just joining, hello, welcome. Uh, we are just diving into the meaty part of our presentation. Um, so I'm really excited to hand over to Tony. Uh, as many of you know, the UK in 2019 became the first major country to actually legislate for a net zero target for carbon emissions by 2050. Um, and a new plan was announced uh, aiming for a, an at least 68% reduction in greenhouse gas, gas emissions by the end of the decade. So the UK is really committed to reducing emissions. Um, it's the fastest rate of any major economy. And uh, the UK has also introduced a, uh, the, the Prime Minister's 10-point plan, which you can look up and read about. Um, and offshore wind and clean energy are obviously feature quite um, centrally in that 10-point plan in helping to eradicate our contribution to climate change, but at the same time as creating and supporting jobs in clean energy sectors. And uh, Tony has been really sort of central to some of this work. So I'm really excited to hand over to Tony to uh, give us a bit of an insight into the UK's offshore wind ecosystem. So without further ado, Tony, over to you. Thanks, Ronit. Um, there is a presentation. What I thought I would do is just very quickly run through a little bit about me, a little bit about the company I work for, um, and then talk a little bit about UK offshore wind, where it's where it's been where it's going, what's happening. And then the, I guess the final link is um, what our plans are in, in the UK for floating offshore wind. Um, I, I guess just before I start, um, I've, I'm actually in, a, in, a, in, in quite a nice position because I've got a, a background in offshore wind, but I guess um, I've got a, a background in offshore wind, having been in offshore wind for, for about 15 years, been involved in, in Sort of 40 offshore wind projects around the world, um, but I'm, I'm a, I guess obviously I'm a Brit. I still live in the UK at the moment, but I work for an American company, and I work America, for an American company in the offshore wind sector in the USA. So I've actually got quite a nice perspective in terms of what where the UK has been, where the UK is at, where the UK is going, and then overlaying that with what's happened in the USA. So it is quite an interesting, interesting mix for me. So it is. Uh, 
Um, hopefully I can bring something to both sides of the Atlantic, I guess. But just very quickly, I've kind of talked about me. I won't mention anything more about me. Just a little bit about my company, Burns & McDonald. We're uh, 7,500, 8,000 professionals in, in the USA, headquartered out of Kansas City. Uh, we get involved in all sorts of, of, of infrastructure projects. For me, the important bit is the fact that we're number one in, in power and we're number one in, in, in uh, transmission distribution. And what I mean by that is we actually design and build uh, uh, power projects and uh, TND projects. We work for every every utility in the USA, and we're second for onshore wind. I don't think there's any stats yet for offshore wind, but I'd like to see where we are on that one, given the activity we're undertaking in the offshore wind sector. So a little bit about uh, what we do very quickly. Sort of items one to four are our traditional activities that we've done in the USA for the last 100 120 years, um, but we're now doing um, a number of offshore activities. So that includes the export cables, the routing substation top sides, secondary steel work, jackets, supply of jackets, um, and then some combined activities as well. So complete electrical system design, um, both AC and DC, owners engineering, project management type of work. So we are we are starting to grow into different activities. And the next slide will give you some idea of sort of the companies that we're working for. So you can see, you know, we're involved in, in a wide cross sector of developers. Um, we're undertaking a range of, of different activities for these guys. Um, and as you can see, we, you know, we're working with developers who have lease areas um, and projects. We're working for developers that have lease areas, um, but no project. I'm working for developers that have neither a lease area or a project. So that, that puts us in a nice position in terms of what's going on and what's, what's going, you know, what's, you know, what the future of the market looks like and, and, and you know, puts us in a good position to be able to help guide and support that. So enough about Burns and Mac, so a little bit about the UK. So this is just to give you some idea of how offshore wind started in the USA. This is the round one projects and the round two projects. Um, you can see the round one projects, you can hardly see them. There's, there's a number of very small yellow dots on there. So for example, on the, on the, uh, on the West Coast, You've got Barrow, you've got Burbo Bank, you've got North Hoyle. So you, you've got a number of small projects there on the West Coast. On the East Coast, you've kind of got in a, you know, Kentish Flats and, and, and in a dowsing. Very, very small projects, very close to shore. You know, not, not big turbines, they're very small turbines as well. Um, I actually think the first offshore wind project in the UK was a, was a two a two turbine project in a place called Blythe, which is just north of Teesside on the map. They were... They were it was technically offshore because the foundations were wet, but you could walk out to them. They were that close to the to, to the shore. You know, that, so they you know, they were they've actually been decommissioned now. So it gives you some idea of how the UK started. Moving on, uh, when we got to round three projects, suddenly it, it, there's a little bit of information on there about about some of the projects that we were at, at, at the time when the round three projects came out. But you can see suddenly the big pink blobs as it were around the UK uh, suddenly are very 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 much bigger and very very much further out you know some of these projects I mean for example the, the big one in the middle on the on the right hand side yeah that one that's Dogger Bank the original you know the original plan for Dogger Bank was nine gigawatts that's and that that's the size of the, of the, of the, of the development and you're talking projects there that are two three hundred miles off the coast of the UK you know, in the middle of the North Sea so these were huge projects as you can see there's a total of something like 32 gigawatts planned now three of those projects didn't happen so the ones effectively on the on the on the, the uh, west coast didn't happen for various technical reasons but the ones on the on the east coast, are starting to happen now. So suddenly, you know, when when uh, round three was announced, you know, basically the UK had 1.5 gigawatts of operational offshore wind and a number of other projects under under construction or awaiting consent or uh, under pre-application. Now, not all of those projects happened again for various different reasons, but is, you know, there's been a, a there was a huge change from round one, round two, massive step change to round three, round four. Uh, has moved on even further. So round four, which is which was very very recently announced last year, um, is basically uh, another seven gigawatts of offshore wind. Now some of some of those uh, um, areas or some parts of those areas have already been awarded. So that, so the UK is, is starting to move very very quickly now um, 
into the uh, the next stages of offshore wind. And as you can see, these these projects are again quite far out. A lot of the technology will be will, will be converting. Actually, actually, sorry, the big project I was talking about, Dogger Bank. There's a there's a huge change there because that now is going to be HVDC rather than HVAC, and that's and that's to do with the distances offshore. So there has been a big step change in technology requirements now in offshore wind. And what I what I would say as well is before we just come on to the next bits, there was a stall in the UK probably about about I don't know five years ago. I'm sure there'll be people on the line who'll correct me. You know, five five or so years ago. Offshore wind stalled a little bit in the UK because there wasn't really a lot of direction from, from the government. There wasn't really a lot of interest at the time. It was stop, start, stop, start. And the other, the other problem was because these projects were further and further out, people realised there was going to be uh, HVDC requirements. But the costs of HVDC then were, were so big that it just wasn't, it wasn't feasible to build these projects. But then what happened was you know, technology advancements, particularly with the turbine sizes, because a lot of the round two projects, the round two and a half projects, the round, start of the round three projects, they were all, a lot of them were using sort of five, six, seven megawatt turbines. And there's been a jump now, as everybody knows, to sort of the, the 10, 12, 15 megawatt turbines. So suddenly you can get you know, twice the power from, from, from half the installation cost. So suddenly these projects that were further out, even taking into account HVDC, suddenly became very much more uh, cost effective, basically because one of the, as everybody knows, one of the big costs in, in offshore wind is one, the turbines, and two, the installation of the turbines. So if you can actually halve the number of turbines and half the installation cost, that's a major, that has a huge impact on the economics. So what I also wanted to mention was, um, you know, Scotland has now identified they want to um, uh, look at doing a lot of projects themselves because the, for those who don't know, the Crown Estate is a bit like Boehm um, uh, and the, the Crown Estate sort of owns the lease areas around the, around the UK. Um, that that is kind of been that's kind of split into two. There's there's the Crown Estate UK and there's the Crown Estate Scotland, and they started to work. I wouldn't say separately, but they but they started to do a little bit more uh, more of their own thing. So the projects identified in round three that was kind of very much England and Scotland and Wales and Ireland kind of thing, kind of UK. Round four has kind of split into two. Um, so you've got the projects we looked at before were very much the seven gigawatts were very much um, in sort of English, Welsh, Northern Irish territorial waters and, and Scotland, Scotland have looked at their own peace areas. And you can see here now, there's a, you know, Scotland have identified an awful lot of, of lease areas, as you can see, so eight to 10 gigawatts of offshore wind. You will notice also the distances of some of these ones. Most of the, most of the projects on the east, on the east side of the UK, so most of the projects in, on, in the North Sea and the projects in the Irish Sea, so that's between England and Ireland or Britain and Ireland, um, Southern Ireland, that they're all, all of that lot can, can probably be done with fixed bottom technology. If you look on here, you know, when we start to move to, to the Northeast, to, sorry, to the Northwest of Scotland, um, you know, N1, N2, N3, N4, we are starting to talk about deeper water. So potentially, you know, floating technology depending depending on exact water depth. So we're starting to move into um, a whole new ball game, which is floating offshore wind, which is obviously what Maine are very interested in. Just for those who who are interested, what are, so what we've set is the UK government as a whole has set a target of about one of a, you know one gigawatt of floating offshore wind by you know, 2030. I have put some um, some some reference. Uh, areas on there I'm, I'm sure uh, Ron it will be sharing these presentation after those after the, uh, after this so if, if people want to reference those uh, some useful contact information there the reason why there's been a step change in the in, in the UK is basically um, well one of the reasons why it's really accelerated recently is because of the sector deal that was announced by the UK government in, in 2019 basically what this was doing this this is trying to give a boost I won't go through I won't read all of this out but again, you, you can read this and you can um, uh, get the, the you know, more detailed information from, from the reference at the bottom. But basically what they were trying to do, what the, the UK government has tried to do is, is inject um, some, some, 
some thought, some idea, um, some money into, into, as it says, producing uh, productivity, increasing involvement, innovation. Um, and at that time, you know, the target was when this was announced was, was 30 gigawatts of installed capacity by 2030. In, uh, in October last year, Boris Johnson announced he wants to increase that to 40 gigawatts. So that's a huge step change considering where we're at now. Which, so the UK at the minute has about 10 and a half gigawatts of installed capacity. So that is a huge step change in 10 years. You know, I mean, it, it's not difficult to do the math, but that's three gigawatts a year, you know, consistently over the next 10 years. And it's because of that, that a lot of the costs now have, have been continuing to tumble down. And suddenly, you know, offshore wind, you know, further out is, is, is making, this, making this far, far, far more viable than it was, you know, even five years ago, certainly 10, 15 years ago, um, and even there are, you know, there are some discussions now that even taking into account um, HVDC, some of the projects that have been talked to, talked about, potentially, potentially the levelized cost of energy for offshore wind for those projects will actually be the cheapest form of, 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 of electricity in the UK. That's 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 how far the UK has gone. I am running through these very quickly because I'm just conscious there's ten minutes, so. Uh, one of the things that the sector deal has done is, is push for uh, clustering. Um, and so that's like, that's the kind of regionalization of offshore wind in the UK. Um, and what, so what, what the UK have done is they've identified sort of eight, eight um, cluster areas around the, around the coast of the UK. And these, this, this, these areas, these clusters, these you know, regional hotspots are working together as a team and you know they're focusing on particular areas of activity. Again, this is slightly difficult to read, so I apologise for that. But again, the details are available on, on the internet. And what you can see is in most places, most most of these most of these uh, sector, most of this clustering activity is supported by the developers, um, and, and possibly even some of the supply chain. So you can see SSE, you can see Equinor, you can see Vattenfall, you can see EDF, Ersted. Um, you know, and, 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 and some of the OEMs, the Siemens Gamesa, you know, Vestas, or as was at the time, MHI Vestas. So, you know, so these, so these companies are, are supporting these clusters. And, you know, the, the, the idea is to, is to create jobs. And you can see the sort of on the, on the right hand side, the right picture, you can see the, the plans, you know, the ideas behind that in terms of that kind of job creation and what it means to the, you know, to the UK job market. Now the issue then is, you know, how how can you how can you put that into the USA? Because I know that you know the USA, all the states like to work very very closely together. Um, so again, this is this is uh, I apologise to Maine. This doesn't include the Maine activity. So I guess this is from the the existing kind of th you know kind of declared 30, 30 gigawatts. I know that, uh, that Aquaventus is is, is, is it has been moving up very quickly. But I, and I have been talking to Dan and the, and the team there about and 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 other guys you know regionally about how you know um, Maine could benefit from some clustering activities. But the you know the obvious the obvious groups are kind of New England, North Mid Atlantic, South Mid Atlantic. But obviously, I you know one of the reasons. <laughs> That may not work, as I understand the politics in the USA. That you know, trying to get some of these states to work together may be a little bit more difficult. It kind of easier said than done. So I get that, but you know, it could be done in different ways. It could be done by skill set. So it doesn't necessarily have to be done regionally. It could be done by skill set. It could be done. It could be done by uh, technology. But one of the ways that things may have to change in the USA is when during the state solicitation process, you know, some of the, some states have been very have been very forceful about local content and local content in, in, in the USA means state content. So when the solicitation process talks about you know, local content, it is that state. So if the, if the solicitation has come out of New Jersey, it means New Jersey supply chain. Um, and then it goes straight from kind of you know, um, local content immediately to, to global content. There's, and it's, there's two steps in the middle, which is regional content, which is what this is, the kind of the clustering. And then you've got national, which is U.S. supply chain. So perhaps, you know, kind of, if it's, you know, working together, the states might be able to might be able to help, um, you know, that that kind of uh, development of the regionalization of the, of the regional supply chains. And also, again, you know, looking at, at, at the, 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 the latest announcements from the White House, this is something that the the new administration are going to be pushing very hard. So there might be some, some federal guidance on, on what has to be done here, but I don't want to get too political there because be careful standing on toes. Um, so 
one of the things again coming back to the sector deal that you know, the, 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 um, that the 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 UK have done, you know, has been looking at at um, development of the offshore wind growth partnership, and this is this is basically to help guide and support uh, off you know um, supply chain companies as they want to grow and as I say exploit you know the growing market, and again. This is, some of this is starting to be done on a state by state basis with the states, you know, starting to work with the supply chains. But again, you know, it could be something at a, at, a, at, a, at a regional or a federal level, you know, to start thinking about actually how do we how do we help supply chain companies from a, a bigger level than just the state start to get involved in the, in the process? Because, you know, having been involved in the American American market now for three or four years, you know, one of the. One of the things that I often hear from the supply chain is, yes, but when is this going to going to affect me? And if you think about construction or, or, or um, you know, operational maintenance of the U.S. offshore wind market, it, it's still a few years away. So people are, are, are pushing back on on wanting to invest too much now um, just in case they don't get involved in the supply chain later on. So, you know, there, there could be you know regional uh, or state, regional, federal support in the set, you know, to help the supply chain in the same way the, you know, the o, uh, um, WGP helps the uh, the UK supply chain, and again, you know, this is there's been some some strategic um, activity taking you know, look looking at you know what we can do better and what the UK can do can do better in certain areas, and what they've done is they've identified a number of different areas. So the foundation, well, again, I won't go through the list. So looking at different activities. Um, that the, the UK supply chain can get involved with. Now you think, well, actually, why isn't the UK supply chain involved in, all, in that anyway? And this is partly because the UK, have, were, when, when offshore wind started in the UK, the UK government, and I guess I will blame the government, yeah, they, weren't, they were not very forceful about ensuring local supply, UK supply. So where in America, you get a lot of, in the US, particularly in certain states, it's, you know, it's in, it's in, New Jersey for New Jersey by New Jersey. It's in Maine by Maine for Maine. In Europe, it was in Germany by Germany for Germany kind of thing. In the UK, it was traditionally in the UK by who anybody wants to come and play in the UK. And that's where the UK, you know, made a mistake at the early stages of the offshore wind market. So what we're trying to do now in the UK is, is, is focus and developing activities that we should really be undertaken in the UK and we shouldn't really be you know um, importing foundations from around the world now the supply chain around the world is is, is better placed than we are at the moment so that's where you know, the UK government is, is saying okay what can we do to help to help the you know to help develop the supply chain and again that model could be used in the US in terms of what can the state and federal um, uh, what state and federal support is there to help the development of those you know, these are fairly major components, you know, foundations. They are, these structures are huge. You don't want to be shipping these things around the world. You know, you know the cables, you don't want to be shipping these things around the world. Substations, you don't want to be shipping these things around the world. But people are. That's what's happening at the moment. That is what is taking place. You know, the installation vessels, okay, a, there's an issue there with the Jones Act at the moment. But what that means is the, Amer you know, the American market has to, has to consider building installation vessels, um, so, you know, that's, there's a number of different activities that we need to think about. There we go. Ron, it's just given me the, uh, the time out sign. I ended exactly, exactly on the moment. So yeah, Ron, back over to you. Thanks, Tony. I was just giving you a one minute warning and you wrapped <laughs> up perfectly on time. Um, that was a great canter through the UK's um, offshore wind development history and some of the things that we can share in terms of best practice with our US partners, particularly Maine. And so without further ado, I will hand over to Habib uh, to tell us a bit about Maine's um, offshore wind ecosystem. This is Habib Dagger. Thank you, Ronit, for uh, inviting me and, and Kate. Um, and a great job, Tony, with your presentation. And Dan, thanks for the introduction. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about um, your main uh, R&D in floating wind and in the New England Aqua Ventus Swan. The um, floating offshore wind turbine is what's needed in the Gulf of Maine because we have deep waters off the, off the coast of Maine. If you're about um, three nautical miles off the coast of Maine, you're in over 300 feet of water. So you really need to use floating turbines. Uh, floating turbines become cost-effective compared to fixed bottom in that 50 meter 
plus or minus range. Uh, to put things in perspective, for many of you who don't know what a floating turbine looks like, I'll start with the anatomy of a floating turbine. This happens to be a semi-submersible floating turbine. Uh, it's got uh, flotation columns. Um, uh, you see one, two, three uh, on the corners and one, uh, the towers in the center. Uh, it's more to the seabed with mooring lines. Um, in this case, we're showing three steel chain mooring lines and there's a mooring anchor at the end. And what comes out of the turbine that delivers electricity is a, called the dynamic cable. It, it does a lazy S wave. It's got buoyancy modules. And that turbine can move around and within a watch circle. And therefore the dynamic cable has to follow the, the turbine as well. So that's what a floating offshore wind turbine looks like. To give you a sense of scale, uh, there's a school bus where my cursor is right now that gives you a sense of what how big these turbines really are. Uh, the, the latest uh, machine that was announced here uh, over the last week is a 15 megawatt turbine that will be installed uh, next uh, next year for the first time. To give you a sense of scale, it's got a 236 meter rotor diameter. That's more than two football fields. Uh, so that's the kind of technologies that, that these floating turbines would have to support. Uh, so the outline of my talk would be a bit about the center, the, the composite center at the University of Maine. Why should Maine be uh, looking at floating turbines and New England should look at floating turbines? Uh, I'll talk to you about the research we've been doing on floating turbines uh, starting 13 years ago. Um, and um, the next step of that would be New England Aquaventus 1. I'll talk a bit about that. And I'll talk a bit about some of the research we're doing on additive manufacturing to help develop next generation blades for these floating turbines. This is the composite center at UMaine. Uh, we're the largest university-based research center in the state of Maine. Uh, we're about 25 years old. Uh, this year will be our 25th anniversary. We have uh, 260 people who work in the lab. Um, and um, we spun off 10 companies from, from the laboratory. And these are our partners and clients from across the globe. We have over 500 partners and clients. Uh, looking forward to do a lot more more work with the with the, our UK partners and Ronald and his. Thanks for getting us all together. In terms of floating wind, why floating wind? This is a map that was put together by the National Renewable Energy Lab that shows in dark blue, and, and in light blue, where the where floating wind is feasible versus shallow water wind, which is fixed bottom wind. Uh, if you look in Maine, you don't see very light blue areas. Uh, and if you, as you go down south, of course, off Massachusetts coast, you see a lot of light blue areas closer to the shore. If you go to the west coast, it's all pretty much dark blue. Uh, roughly about 60% of the U.S. offshore wind resource within 50 miles could potentially be harnessed using floating technologies. But if you go back to Maine, uh, we have no choice but to use floating. And you look at all the dark blue off the coast of Maine. And that's typically about 50 meters water depth is your cutoff, cutoff point. Now, there's been a, a, a look, looking at what Tony's talked about is really clustering, working together across states and regions. Uh, uh, the Bureau of Ocean and Man Energy Management had put together a Gulf of Maine Ocean uh, Task Force to look at uh, joint collaborative efforts on identifying sites off the coast of Maine that, and, 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 and Mass and New Hampshire. So there, there is some, some collaboration, Tony, that's going on in our neighborhood. Uh, I'd like to also see some collaboration uh, north of us. Uh, I know, I know uh, there's opportunities there um, with some of the hydropower that you see off north of us in Quebec and in others uh, to provide some of the riding uh, or firming power for offshore wind that would take place in the Gulf of Maine. So I think collaboration both north of us and, and south of us is, is, is something that would be uh, quite useful in moving this technology forward. Uh, a, a bit of why we got into this here uh, back 13 years ago is um, at the time, uh, fossil fuel prices went up to $4 a gallon. And, and at that time, um, it was very difficult to heat homes in Maine at $4 a gallon because we, use, we, we were using three quarters of Maine used heating oil to heat our homes. If you look at uh, EIA data, the Energy Information Administration data over the last five years, you'll see that Maine used between 3.6 and $5.8 billion per year in terms of fossil fuels. And none of this, of course, exists in Maine. So there's a real opportunity here to, to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels if we, if we bring in renewables. And we ran some numbers about 12 years ago that showed that if we harness just 3% of the offshore wind resource within 50 miles, of the coast of Maine, in the, within the Gulf of Maine, we would heat, we could heat every home and drive every car. 
and, and, and certainly electrifying heating and transportation will require about five gigawatts of offshore wind. We're not really advocating for five gigawatts of offshore wind. We're just saying that if we harness that much, we could heat every home and drive every car in the state of Maine. So uh, what, do, what do offshore wind turbines look like? There's three different categories of floating offshore wind turbines. Uh, the simplest one is called the spar buoy. It's like a big floating tube, essentially, with a ballast at the bottom. It's like if you took a, a, a Pepsi bottle and, and put a bunch of sand at the bottom of it and emptied it up from its liquid content, put it into the water, uh, it will stand vertically up. And that's really what a spar looks like. And to do that, you need very deep waters, over 200 feet of water depth to be, be able to launch a spar from dockside and tow it out. So there are no... Um, we don't have 200 feet of water in, in, in New England near the coast to launch a spar. Semi-submersibles work like a boat. In this case, you have three floating uh, bodies that hold up the tower. If, you've, if you're familiar with, with catamarans, if, you, if you're from a boat building world, a catamaran has two hulls, and what keeps it stable is, is the size of the hulls and how far apart they are. In this case, this particular unit has three hulls, one, two, and three, and it's called the semi-submersible. It works like a cat, essentially, a catamaran, except with three hulls. Uh, this, this other design is called the tension light platform. Um, and all of these, by the way, are borrowed from the oil and gas industry. And, and, and it's got tension legs um, and buoyancy in the hull. And the buoyancy keeps the, tension, the legs under tension and, and, and provides a stability. We looked at all these designs for the Gulf of Maine over the last 13 years and, and, and decided to focus on, on the semi-submersible type. Uh, and notice there's not a lack of ideas for floating turbines. These are different types of floating turbines uh, that you could see that people are pursuing around the world. So there are over uh, 40 different designs right now around the world. And, and again, we studied every one of them very carefully and, and figured that, that the, the semi-submersible types are the best for our region because of the type of construction that's necessary. Uh, we, we built some facilities in the state of Maine to help design and develop these kinds of technologies. This is the Alphon W Square Ocean Engineering Lab. What you see right in there is the floating turbine that's being tested under an open jet wind tunnel and we have equipment. So, and this is a very unique facility in the US. There's nothing like it anywhere anywhere else. When at the time we built it, there was nothing like it in the world. And the whole purpose of that is, is to advance the design of, of floating turbines as well as uh, other types of uh, offshore structures. In uh, 2013, we launched, uh, Tony sh showed us the first um, grid-connected uh, uh, offshore wind project in the US. This was the first grid-connected offshore wind project in, in the United States. It was built off the coast of Maine in 2013. It was a floating turbine launch. It's a one to eight scale version that we launched, uh, built at the university and launched from Brewer, Maine, towed it down the Penobscot River, as you see right here. It was towed down in 2013, in about 12 hours, and we had pre-installed mooring lines and anchors, and it pre-installed undersea cable, where we connected the hull uh, in Castine to its location. Um, and we had an undersea cable uh, and over 50 sensors on board to measure the motions of the hull to tell us whether we can really predict what happens. Uh, and, um, and this is an example of the first storm we saw, a 50-year storm relative to the size of the hull, to put things in perspective, a 50-year storm in the Gulf of Maine uh, has over 60-foot waves relative to, to the hull size. In this case, it was a 1 to 8 scale version. But you could see here the size of the waves and uh, relative to the size of the hull. And notice as you look at that, you don't see the hull move in a 50-year storm. You can't even see the hull move pitch back, back and forth. So, so the design does work, and we can design floating turbines that will sustain 50-year winds and 500-year winds. I know it's hard to believe that you can, but you actually can. And, and um, in this case, um, this particular hull moved off vertical by seven degrees in a 500-year storm. So it's the very stable hulls. The next phase of our program is to build a full-size unit. It'll be 10 to 12 megawatt uh, off Monhegan Island in a test site that was selected by the state of Maine about a decade ago for the university to use. The, the state selected that site, assigned it to you, Maine, to do this research. Uh, and this, uh, this hull will, will, will be in 300 feet of water. It'll be 10 to 12 megawatts. It's, it's built using a technology developed by the University of Maine. It's a semi-submersible hull that's made out of concrete. It's made out of pre-stressed concrete or concrete cans and concrete squares. So the idea is, to industrialize the production and make it locally by making concrete cans and concrete squares. 
essentially, and you put them all together, post tension them to make a hull. Uh, so, so the industrialization uh, borrows from what we call uh, segmental concrete bridge industry. So we're building a hull like we build bridges, and that's already a commercialized system uh, that's industrialized, and we, we, we're borrowing from uh, three to four decades of, of developing this uh, bridge construction methodology and applying it, if you wish, to hulls. And um, we've uh, also been joined by RWE and Mitsubishi Diamond in this particular di uh, offshore wind project. So we're very excited to work with the Diamond and uh, with RWE and the state of Maine to make this a reality. In terms of research projects we're working on, one of the big major concerns um, that we have in our neighborhood is, is the impact of floating turbines on, on the fisheries. So we're looking at ways to reduce that impact. We don't have the solutions yet, but we're working on some solutions. And one of them potentially is synthetic mooring lines. Uh, we got funded by the US Department of Energy to look at rather than using steel chain mooring lines, as you see here, uh, by using synthetic mooring lines that would have actually uh, a, a smaller footprint. The, the, in this case, the mooring anchors would be closer to the hull and that would be uh, less interfere potentially less interference with the fishing. We'd have to do a lot of studies on that, but that's the direction we're heading. So, so there's a technology of the future. We're also looking at technologies to help uh, develop next generation blades. That's a blade being tested in our laboratory. This happens to be a 160 foot blade. It sits there for about a month like that to look at the fatigue performance of a blade. So as, as we look at the larger offshore wind blades, the 15 megawatt turbines with over 110 meter uh, blades, uh, making these, uh, making the first prototype is difficult. It takes, it costs more than $10 million to make the first prototype of a blade of a new design. Uh, how do you, and it takes over a year to do that. Can we do it faster? Can we reduce the cost? So one thing we're looking at is, is actually segmenting the blade tooling, the molds for the blade. You can see a person here next to the mold. And the idea is to print these, to print these molds and, and make them faster if you wish than you would, you would if you make it using normal, um, normal methods. Uh, in this case, we have been funded by the US Department of Energy to actually do that. And in the next couple of years, stay tuned, we'll be printing molds for these next generation larger uh, 15 megawatt blades. And to give you a sense of the machine we'll be using to print those molds, that's my last slide, um, is, is a, we, we printed a boat here um, about a year ago. Uh, in three days, we started on, th uh, on, um, on Thursday night and finished on Sunday night. And um, it's a 25 foot marine patrol vessel uh, that weighs about 5,000 pounds that was printed all in one piece. So it's not uh, unfeasible if you wish for us to print sections of blades, if you wish for tooling for the blades. So, so with this in mind, um, I'll move on to my last slide is, uh, we talked about floating offshore wind, why in Maine? Well, because Maine has no choice. We have deep waters. If we're gonna do anything, we're gonna go to floating. And we've been doing research on floating wind for over um, 13 years right now, and have come to the conclusion that the semi-submersible types seem to be the ones that are more likely to be feasible for our neighborhood because of the type of manufacturing infrastructure and water depth that we have. We, we chose concrete because we can make it locally. And we're trying to demonstrate that right now using New England Aquaventus One. We start construction if all goes well next year and have it in FY23 uh, in, in the water. And we're also looking at ways to reduce the impact of, of mooring systems on the fisheries by going to synthetic mooring lines. And we're also looking at ways to accelerate the development of larger blades by additive manufacturing the blades. So with this in mind, and hand it back over to you, Rona. Thank you so much, Professor. That was a fascinating canter through some of the amazing innovations that the University of Maine is pioneering. I have to say, I have visited the boat, as you know, and it is just incredible to see something like that 3D printed, um, as almost like making something out of nothing. People often describe to me that science and innovation are the exit strategy for some of the global issues that we face. And you can definitely see uh, the ways in which uh, University of Maine's research is is contributing to the ways in which we're going to reduce our emissions as a as a global community. So, uh, I was wondering, I'm taking my moderator's privilege, uh, Habib and Tony, uh, can you both tell us, perhaps starting with you, Tony, what do you see as the greatest challenge to the offshore wind sector in the UK in the next, say, five years? The greatest challenge is actually, you know, is the supply chain going to be robust enough to be able to deliver this three gigawatts a year? 
Now, it's a huge challenge. It's a huge uh, target for the, for the UK to try and achieve. And, you know, are, are there going to be enough vessels out there? Are, is the supply chain going to be able to cope with the number of turbines? You know, we are going to have to think about additional places where, where this stuff is manufactured, as I was saying before. You know, can the, you know, is the, not just the UK supply chain big enough, but the global supply chain big enough to be able to cope with all of this. And then, of course, you've then got, as far as the UK itself is con- you know, concerned, you know, the connection issues. Actually, are we going to be able to get all this power, you know, this power ashore? Because there's a 20, 20 gigawatts of additional offshore wind has been talked about in, in 10 years. So, uh, you know, so uh, 30, 30, sorry, 30 gigawatts of offshore wind been talked about in 10 years. So, again, how are we actually going to get all this power to shore? So there's a number of there's a number of issues there um, that that we've got. Yes, the supply chain exists. Yes, we know how to do it. Yes, we've done it before, but you know there are some technology advances, particularly as the as we move from AC to DC. Um, so you know that that is that is still growing. You know that that knowledge that 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 skill set is still growing out there. People, you know, HVDC has been around for a long time, but not necessarily from a, from a, an offshore wind perspective, you know. So, you know, perhaps the UK has to think about some kind of, you know, sort of offshore grid, you know, some sort of meshed offshore grid to actually, you know, that, so the power can be directed to, you know, landed in, in, in different areas, depending on what's going on, depending depending where the wind's blowing, depending where the wind's not blowing, you know, the power can be redirected around the UK, both onshore and offshore. You know, is the onshore... Um, as I say, is the onshore, you know, the onshore infrastructure big enough? The traditional offshore, uh, so onshore uh, infrastructure in the UK was very much uh, located around the old, the old uh, coal mining industries. That's where the power, the power plants were based. So it, they were very centralised. You know, offshore wind almost by definition is decentralised. So you know, there's a couple of you know, the transmission issues, supply chain issues. Um, you know, to a certain extent, that's no different to the USA. It's just, it's just the UK is just at a different stage. That's all. Same issues. What do you think, Professor Dago? Same, same issues. What would you say are the main challenges in the next five years for the industry? Uh, certainly, there are technical challenges, but there's also um, infrastructure challenges, uh, and and there are people challenges. So there's really three three sets of challenges. On the on the technical side, I think we're in good shape. We've uh, we've we've got some good technologies if you wish to do that. But from an infrastructure perspective, we uh, we, we we need some um, to upgrade our port facilities to allow us to move forward. If you wish to scale up uh, these technologies to drive the cost down, we can't drive the cost down without scale. We can't have scale without port facilities. So, so development of port facilities and infrastructure, if you wish, uh, needed to, to deploy uh, offshore wind in New England and, and, and beyond New England in the U.S. Is, is really important. There are vessel in, uh, concerns, of course, with the, um, you've heard from Tony, um, how do we deploy these, these units? How do we have operating vessels that are made in the U.S. and deal with the Jones Act? And finally, the, the people parts issues is how do we work together, um, and and how do we work together with with the fishing industry, and and um, uh, they have they have concerns and legitimate concerns that that need to be addressed, and w- w- we're certainly all ears to, to 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 work with them. To put things in perspective, in the Gulf of Maine, we can heat every home and drive every car with three percent of the area off the coast of Maine. So so hopefully we can we can find a way to all work together and identify which three percent it is that we can all we can all agree that maybe we could put some turbines in. And so um, so working together um, is very important. The people challenges, if you wish, and working together across states is another challenge as well. I think, like you said, we really. Um, the states act like states, and and uh, and um, I think we're all working. We're all willing to work together as long as the jobs are in our own states, right? So, uh, and, and, and so how do we how do we how do we do that? And but I think we have a very unique opportunity to really w- reach not just across the south of us, but north of us. And and you've got some real synergies, if you wish, with the hydro resource north of us here. And if we can um, tune that hydro resource resource to provide the riding power, if you wish, the firming power for offshore wind, uh, it, it's a it's a very, very good combination. So that's going to require Dan and, and, and our governor's office and others to reach north as well as south. So, but I, I know they're thinking about all these things. So thank you so much, uh, both. Um, that's a perfect segue into my my final question. 
you know, you've got lots of people on this call who are science festival enthusiasts, who are people who are really interested in um, the ways in which science and innovation can help us address global challenges. So in terms of not reaching just north and south, but also across the pond to one another, what are you both most excited about? Professor Dagger, what are you most excited about in terms of working with the UK? And Tony, what excites you most about working with Maine? Since you're asking me first here, Ron, I'm saying I'm very excited to work with the UK. Uh, the first thing we did 13 years ago um, when, um, when we started looking at offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine is I took out a number of trips to Europe and, and uh, because Europe is way ahead of us and the UK is, has been and for a long time uh, in terms of um, uh, we, we have a lot to learn, not only on the technology side and, and scale up side, but, but also we have a lot to learn on, on, on the policy side. There's been, uh, you, the UK has done a tremendous job on the policy side to put together uh, a, a very rational program that transcends administrations, if you wish, uh, and that, uh, that allowed the UK to, to, to move forward uh, uh, and to be supported. So I think, I think that's a challenge that we, we, we can learn a lot from. And uh, so, and, and I know Dan is very, very interested to do that and wants to do that. So we're all ears. We're all, we have a lot to learn and, 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 and looking forward to, to, to those collaborations. So. Thanks, Professor. Tony, what, what about you? What are you most excited about in terms of working with Maine? And then perhaps Dan, we'll, we'll close with you. I think for me, it's the, the, the most exciting bit is the, it's the size of the opportunity that Maine's got. I think it is. I mean, yes, there is, there's some things that Maine can learn from. You know, from from the processes, the systems, the, the federal lead, the state lead, all that kind of stuff. But actually, for me, the really exciting bit is actually the size of the opportunity that Maine has got. It is huge. It is massive. Um, and I think it's not just Maine. You know, Maine can actually lead the way, not only in the US from, from a floating technology point of view, but actually globally from a, from, a, from a floating technology point of view. You know, I, I heard some I heard some some. So, sort of one stat well, a little while ago that by 2050, um, 50 percent of offshore wind will be floating technology. Uh, at the minute, floating technology is about I don't know, pick a number, 0.1 percent, half a percent, one percent. You're very, 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 very low. So that's that's a, that's a that's a very very steep steep curve to get to 50 by 50, as it were, um, 50% by 2050. But, but, you know, but the US is, is ideally placed to do that, given your water depths. And Maine is even, you know, with the aspirations that Maine has got, um, and I, I will say some of the, the lack of bureaucracy that perhaps some of the Western states have got internally, you know, Maine, Maine can actually do this, this kind of stuff pretty quickly and get on with it, therefore being a world leader. So that, you know, that, that makes it really, really exciting from my point of view, just that, that position that Maine can take. Yeah, and I think I would just add, it's a, a ton to learn from, from what's already happened in the UK and, and around the world. So it's exciting to open up the dialogue for these partnerships and as we all kind of go and moving in the same direction um, pretty, pretty quickly. And I think that from a Maine perspective, as we, you know, are, have set some pretty ambitious targets around uh, electrification of, of vehicles to, elect uh, to electrification of um, home heating. Offshore wind is, is um, coming kind of right on time, right? Uh, arguably, a little, you know, be, maybe it had been nice for it, uh, from, I'm sure, Dr. Dogger's sake, for it to been happen a little bit earlier. But I think, you know, looking at uh, the, the technology advancements on both the electrification side with technology advancements in the floating offshore wind space. It's just a, a, the start of a really exciting decade for all things um, uh, related. So it's a it's really exciting for the state. You know, looking forward to seeing where we go. Say so thank you all. The science festivals are some of our favorite places to be. Hopefully next year we'll be all together at MSF in person in Maine. And perhaps I'll hand back to Kate to just say goodbye. Thanks very much. Um, this was really wonderful. And uh, my, my huge thanks to everybody who participated here. And especially, Tony, I'm glad that you said that we have a chance to be world leaders because I say that uh, as an, a constant part of my elevator speech when I talk about all of the great things that we have happening here in Maine. So it's a validation that it's not just me who thinks that. Um, my ego is pretty healthy, but it's nice to know that it's, it's actually uh, sets on something. So wonderful thanks. My thanks to all of you. Um, and, and I'm definitely looking forward to doing this in person again as well. Thanks so much. The Maine Science Festival has received sponsorship support for this bonus Maine Science podcast from the Bioscience Association of Maine and Maine Public. 
The Maine Science Podcast was recorded at Discovery Studios at the Maine Discovery Museum in Bangor, Maine. The Maine Science Podcast is produced and edited by me, Kate Dickerson. I received production support from Miranda Bouchard. The variation on the Discover Maine theme was composed and performed by Nick Parker. <laughs>